Welcome back guys to part number two of the intuitive eating roundtable. I really do hope that you're going to enjoy this part number two as much as part number one. If you haven't watched part number one already, go ahead and do it now because otherwise it's hard to actually understand the entire episode. Furthermore, I just wanted to take the moment to thank you very much for always tuning in to continuously support us. Also, in that regard, hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification button so that you're always up to date when a new episode is going live. So, without further ado, let's delve into the episode. And so. of all health, mental, physical, and emotional. Miguel, I know you had uh, an additional point there. Yeah, I kind of have two points. I'll first of all address uh, something that, that the Jackson said are kind of like building up on, on, or I guess more like building up on the fact that we can have these periods of, of intuitive eating or maybe going full into intuitive eating and kind of eating whatever we, we, uh, we would like sort of during periods of maybe where we're trying to build mass. Um, one of the papers that I think that like probably all of us are familiar with or is the Garth one from 2013 when people were trying, where they were like assessing uh, body composition changes in response to hypercaloric feeding um, or hypercaloric feeding. I mean, and this was done actually, if we, if we look at the study, it's, it's quite interesting because they did something where it, it could be considered where one group kind of did a more intuitive approach where they were basically told, hey, just eat a libidum. These are your, your, your rules, your principles, just go ahead and eat this. Um, they put them on, on a progressive training protocol. And then the other group was given an actual nutrition intervention where pretty much as, as maybe a coach would do, they were told you're going to eat this many calories in a surplus. And mind you, this study was on, uh, on elite Norwegian athletes. So this, this was uh, some elite, I think it was like rowers, soccer players, karate athletes. There's a whole bunch of like what would be considered elite athletes in, in, in Norway. Um, and they did find that both groups gained the same amount of lean body mass. And just the, the only difference was that the group that actually had the nutritional intervention um, gained more body fat. And that kind of caused me to, to think that, first of all, if, if we're going to say that in order to maximize hypertrophy in athletes and, and bodybuilders and things like this, um, we probably don't need that large of an energy surplus. And the energy surplus that we do need can probably be sensed by, 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 by mechanisms that we, that, that we do have. Say, okay, well, for training, we're spending all this energy, we need to build muscle. We probably have the energetic sensing mechanisms to be able to at least come close to maximizing hypertrophy. Sure, the group that, that, uh, that, uh, that had the nutritional intervention put on a very small, more amount of muscle mass that was not significant, but they also gain a lot more fat. So I think that we can probably arguably say that bodybuilders and elite athletes can probably take a more intuitive approach in the off season. And if not maximize rates of muscle hypertrophy, come very close to it. I know Jackson had a point. I just want to make a point only because I've read that study and I always find it, the Garth study frustrates me a little bit because we're very limited uh, studies on kind of surpluses and muscle growth, but like you said, they're, they were elite athletes, but they were also doing their sport alongside their training, which as we know, we've got the MRV king here that's going to take away from your ability to recover and potentially grow. And I think that for me was something that didn't kind of sit right in that they were still doing other activities. So potentially if they were fully focused specificity wise on hypertrophy, that higher surplus could have led to even more muscle growth and less fat gain. But I'll let Jackson go. I just, I, it's just because you brought up the study that's kind of close to me. <laughs> so, so if you look at, if you look at studies actually coming out of that same research group, um, which pretty much they have access to all of the Norwegian Olympic athletes pretty much on site at the Institute of Sport. Um, they actually did a follow up paper um, where one group did eat ad libitum. Um, and the other group received a meal plan. Now this is 12 weeks of strength training four times per, four times per week. Um, now the meal plan group in that study actually added 3% lean mass while the intuitive group had no significant, so significant change. Um, so I sort of dispute your line of thinking there, Miguel. Um, and I think that if you look at this paper, um, the, the follow-up paper by Garth, if, if you're lifting weights regularly and I assume trying to achieve some form of adaptation from that training, um, then intuitively eating or just eating by hunger cues um, has the potential to have you spinning your wheels for a bit, even when training is regular and of high effort. Uh, Mike and then Gabby. So I, I remember reading this paper back in the day. I think it's a pretty good example of uh, statistical significance, uh, 
having something left to uh, to be desired versus taking a look at group differences. So the reason they don't come to significance is because the overall changes in both groups and, and lean body mass were so small. But if you look at the raw numbers, the total lean body mass increased in the group that planned the diet, or sorry, the unplanned group, the group that ate ad libitum, they uh, got an average of 1.9 kilogram increase uh, in LBM. So 1.9 for the group that did ad libitum. And for the planned group, the diet group, they gained 2.8 kilograms. Now, that's not statistically significant due to sample sizes and due to the small difference between them in absolute terms. But, uh, gee, that's almost like a third, you know, 33% better results as far as muscle gain. Uh, if you look at it that way, and of course, Jackson talks about the other studies uh, that have occurred later. So I think if you're, you know, from this study, we can probably conclude if we're using only statistical significance that there's no difference between a whole lot of anything. Uh, a lot of folks would say that if you look at elite athletes, you'll find almost no statistical significance one way or the other because they're also so very close to their peak levels of adaptation and pushing so much physiology to its peak at the same time. There's not much room for growth or give. Um, and uh, but to that point, this we see much higher actual gains in muscle here with this group, and the other studies that sought to replicate this way higher, and sometimes no muscle gain. Doesn't follow a purposeful diet. I would be uh, with Jackson on this one, saying that if you're an elite athlete, um, you should be the last person on earth willing to do a uh, ad libitum intake and leave things to chance. I sure as hell wouldn't want to do an ad libitum intake if I've got the Olympics coming up. I would want everything controlled as possible. Um, and I would be interested in divesting potentially from my current psychological health uh, at the expense of my current psychological health to win an Olympic gold medal so that I could later clean up the mess I was cleaning up. And to be completely honest, after an Olympic gold medal, I might not have to clean up a whole lot of messes because holy shit, that was worth it. So I think that um, the, uh, the ad libitum eating is a really awesome thing to do for hard training folks that are athletes and who don't want to obsess with weight, but especially for folks that are trying to gain muscle uh, there will be periods of time where you have to push yourself to do things you don't want because your body probably doesn't doesn't want to gain that much muscle. I, I'm not sure I speak for anyone else here, but I've myself gained a considerable amount of weight over the course of my lifting career. When I was in high school, my freshman year, when I was 14, I weighed 100 pounds and uh, I've gone up to as big as a drug-free 270. Um, and I did that through forced overeating in, in uh, phases of, of many, many types. And I used to eat and want to throw up and eat again and want to throw up. And that's how I got really big. And I think that's how you get really big is push your body outside a comfort zone. It would almost be um, a tantamount, I think, to, to saying uh, and eating is intuitive eating or sorry, just, uh, you know, ad libitum eating is, is this uh, going to get you similar results as not is to say that a purely auto regulatory approach to training can get you as good of results as an approach that has some milestones and markers um, you know, if, if we did a purely intuitive approach to training, I would absolutely never deadlift or squat ever, ever again, Just never want to do those things, but we have to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone as dictated by the plan because the plan knows better than our bodies. We have to listen to our bodies so that there's a negotiation there, but I think that no plan at all misses a lot of gains, maybe most of them for folks, especially on the upper arm of, uh, of weight training experience. Go ahead, Gabby. Um, it's interesting that the, the topic keeps coming back to, can we use intuitive eating with weight outcomes as the goal? No, no, that's not the point. And I think that discussion just is a sign that, that you know, we're still kind of focused in this, like with this diet culture Why not, mentality. Gabby? Why not? You guys have touched on it, exactly that the outcomes we're looking at are not focused on weight. The outcome that we're moving toward is facilitating a normal eating pattern in an individual who has a harmful relationship with food. That's not everyone. So of course not everyone needs to be doing intuitive eating. The other thing that I wanna stress, there's a difference between intuitive eating, mindful eating, and ad-lib eating. So ad-lib eating is Perhaps just we're eating mindlessly whatever we want until we feel perhaps uncomfortably full or just because the plate is clean. So there are all just external factors driving what we might be eating. And that's something that I really 
hope to see more in studies when we're doing, you know, food hyperpalatability studies, and we're seeing that people tend to um, eat much higher amounts of foods that are highly processed and hyperpalatable. I'm very curious to see, would we see differences in intakes in individuals who have uh, honed their mindful eating skills so that they would eat in response to biological hunger and satiety signals, um, certainly savoring the food and enjoying it, but not eating past the point of fullness and not eating just because the food is present. So that's one thing that I think is also worth stressing that when we're looking at individuals who are just eating ad lib, are those individuals eating mindfully? Are those individuals following some of the principles that are uh, emphasized in intuitive eating and, uh, you know, more appropriately in the cycle of mindful eating being, we first ask ourselves, am I biologically hungry? If, if so, what, what would serve my needs right now? What do I have? Applying the principles of nutrition that I'm aware of. Or if I'm not hungry, why do I want to eat? Is there something else that would better meet my needs? Theoretically, if an individual were to enter one of those studies or be in a tempting food environment and they're not biologically hungry, they would perhaps choose not to eat at all versus a person who has not done any of that internal work and is like, wow, this food is free and it's here and I don't care if I'm hungry, I'm going to eat it anyway and I'm going to eat um, until I'm uncomfortably full. So to your point about um, you know, intuitive training and just following uh, an auto-regulated training plan. Well, an auto-regulated training plan, there, it's, it's not auto-regulation is not a training plan. It's something that we could apply. And it is very similar to some of the skills that we use in mindful eating, which is to apply uh, sort of a, you know, the recognition of hunger and then also a metric for the amount of hunger that we are experiencing at that time. Am I a two or a three on the hunger scale? That means that I likely have a biological need for food. I'm having signals that my stomach is empty and perhaps my blood sugar is low and it's time to eat. And so I eat until I am physiologically satisfied. Not to say that there's not a plan there because we are still working toward a goal of facilitating normal eating patterns. Just like we apply auto regulation so we don't go to the gym every day and just go to failure on every single set and have no plan for what's going to happen next time. We're not going to every meal eating until we're physically can't fit anything more into our stomachs with no plan for the next meal. So mindful eating is about eating with attention to the experience and also in intention. So what do I want this meal to do for me? I want it to fuel me. I want to feel like I'm a maybe five uh, out of 10 on the hunger scale after this meal. And then I want to just go about my business. And it's not that we don't have any... Um, thoughts or any rationale behind what we're choosing to eat. There is, there are aspects of education in both intuitive eating and uh, mindful eating um, as sort of one of the programs uh, of mindful eating in that we apply either it's gentle nutrition in intuitive eating or uh, with the mindful eating programs that I've seen, it's really just sort of a nutritional IQ. Just knowing that food has no specific morality, but that carbohydrates and proteins serve specific functions, fat serve specific function, what types of foods might be highest in either one, how do we kind of want to um, plan our, our eating patterns to best serve us, to fuel us without having any guilt or shame about it. Just like, you know, if we go out for uh, a max deadlift and we don't make it, we're not like, oh, I'm the worst person ever. I suck at this. I'm not going to do this sport anymore. We just say, oh, that didn't go as planned. Let's recognize why that was and improve. Of course, emotions are going to play a role across the board, whether we're looking at eating behaviors, whether we're looking in the gym. You know, I, I know that we have like the um, robotic octopus, uh, the RP is developing to take over the world, but people unfortunately are still emotional creatures. I know it's a secret. Um, uh, but so, so, you know, we have to recognize that, yeah, emotions will play a role, but neither intuitive eating nor mindful eating nor uh, you know, auto-regulating our programs or even developing a training program are at the whim of our emotions. We still need to acknowledge them and be aware of them, um, but being mindful is just paying attention non-judgmentally and then maybe changing course as needed based on those outcomes. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. 
Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. See you there. Go Sorry, ahead, real quick. Is it okay if I jump in? So I think, uh, so Gabby, you mentioned the term normal. Uh, eating normally is the goal. Um, I would be a little bit averse to that term per se because I don't think a mindful approach to eating is normal. I think it is abnormal. I think it is better than normal. I think uh, if you take animals, for example, like if you have a dog, it eats exclusively mindlessly and very normally for a dog. I think most people haven't come very far away. I think most people who are pretty skinny or just lean and active, they're not very mindful eaters. Their hunger cues just aren't that powerful. They just get full faster. You know, like I used to go to school with kids that would eat one meal a day. They would just wake up, begin to code, and then realize at 9 p.m. they were starving, go to the sushi uh, uh, you know, restaurant, have two rolls, and be like, oh my God, I'm so full. And, what? What? And then they would just stop eating, and then they would go home and fall asleep and repeat, and they would weigh 100 pounds or whatever. So I think it may be, because, you know, a lot of this uh, language of normality, which I'm absolutely not, I know you know, um, you did, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to say you didn't mean to use the term normal, but I know how you're using that term, and I completely agree with you. But I think that term is used by other folks in ways that don't convey the reality of the situation. They look out in the world, and they look at all their skinny friends, and they think, oh, they have a normal relationship with food. Fuck, no, they just smoke a lot more cigarettes and do a lot more coke than you, right? That may very well be the case. They're just not as hungry, but they also like, oh my God, like, you know, girls will be like, oh my God, I ate like three bags of Cheetos. Ha ah, ha like, is that, is that intuitive? Is that mindful? Does she know how to put the Cheetos down? Is she actively like controlling her emotions and, and realizing what's coming from a place of, of, of sort of hardiness and fulfillment biologically versus one that's a toxic emotionality of eating. No, fuck no, she doesn't know any of that shit. She just decides she just doesn't want Cheetos anymore and then that lasts for three days versus you, for you, it lasts for a day and a half and then that's why you're, you know, 70 kilos and she's 60 or something like that. So I think we can maybe shift the paradigm a little bit to say, hey, mindful eating specifically is something everyone can learn and benefit from. We don't want to eat normally. There's no return to innocence. That's like sort of a noble savage myth. Like we didn't, you know what I mean? There's a, which is a great song by Enya, great album too. Um, so uh, there's, uh, there's this thing like is normal eating. I have a really interesting example one time from a client I used to work with who will, who will remain nameless. Um, she was uh, in uh, pursuing her PhD in uh, disordered eating, okay, like that was her PhD, and she was uh, rotating at a site, uh, a clinic, and uh, there was, uh, she was also contracting me to enhance her body composition at the time, and, uh, you know, she asked for strategies, she was going to go to this event at the clinic, um, where they were going to have pizza, right, and I was like, oh, no problem, uh, one of the options you have is to mix a protein shake, uh, and bring it with you or bring powders with you and mix the shake with you and uh, just fill it up in the drinking fountain and drink your shake instead of eating pizza. And she was like, no, 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 no. They're going to judge the shit on me for that. I might lose the rotation because that's abnormal and I'm supposed to be eating pizza. And I was like, I didn't give her too much pushback because, you know, the sort of client coach uh, relationship is client driven as always. So I'm like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. No worries. You, you feel free to eat pizza and we'll just tackle this next time. What I wanted to say was, what the fuck kind of clinic of inclusiveness are you at where drinking a protein shake is bad and eating pizza is good? It's supposed to be both of those are neutral and just whatever your goals are. Do you want to currently enjoy yourself with your friends and eat pizza? Pizza it up. Do you want to have, do you, do you have overarching physique goals in which you have to have a protein shake that you're fundamentally okay with in a long-term sense? Well, then I'm going to totally love and respect the shit out of you for having a protein shake and I'm never going to give you shit. She was at a clinic. This was, this was one of the best clinics in the, in the United States for this sort of thing. And she was very convinced that she was going to have a lot of pushback from his people. I'm like, why aren't you eating pizza? What the fuck is so good about pizza? Am I supposed to be eating? Is that normal? Do you see what I'm saying, Gabby and, and the rest of you folks? Like that, that normal, I'm not accusing you of using the term normal in a, in a poor way. I just want to make sure that folks who listen to this understand when, like when Gabby and I say normal, Gabby says normal, we don't mean like it's like a return back to what you used to be and what everyone else is. Most people aren't even that. It's better. The mindful eating makes you eat like very few people do, but makes you get not very few of the bad things out of food and many of the good things as well. Gabby, correct me if I'm imposing my views too, too much or saying- No, no. Yeah, that's accurate. And I think that's part of the 
Part of the unfortunate manifestation of some of these ideologies is that we become judge judgmental on either end. And yeah, absolutely. There's no moral high ground with food. It's not that pizza or a protein shake is better. And, you know, if I'm going to choose between the two because I'm like painfully lactose intolerant, I'm going to go for a plant-based protein shake if that's my only other option outside of pizza. Because part of the um, idea, part, part of haze and part of intuitive eating and part of mindful eating, really, it's all recognition of what, and I don't want to say feels good as in, you know, feels good just emotionally, but I, I say feels good emotionally, mentally and physically, so things that will digest comfortably. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, when they, and, and the books use the term normal uh, uh, eating habits. Now, I will go on a limb and, and say that I assume a normal eating pattern would be one in which uh, we eat in response to biological hunger most of the time. Sometimes we eat food because it's there and it's tasty and that's okay. There are no specific rules, but most of the time we're responding to biological hunger and responding to biological uh, satiety signals. And then we're not giving it much more thought beyond that, that I was hungry, I ate what I needed, I'm no longer hungry now, and that we're, we're shifting the focus from external cues of eating to internal cues of eating so that we know we, we, even if we don't have specific macros, because I think this is what get, this is what causes a lot of people a lot of strife. You know, once they're done with the the diet, quote unquote, using diet as you know a planned phase of uh, food intake to reduce body size, and they've done that according to macros or a meal plan, and then they stop using the macros. Now they have no internal cues to determine when they're supposed to eat or when they're supposed to stop eating. And so now they're around an abundance of food. They have uh, several metabolic adaptations that might um, enhance their desire for food. You know, they could have developed some level of uh, disordered eating. And so now they don't know when to start eating or to stop eating. They are driven to eat really hyper palatable foods in large amounts. And then we could potentially, um, you know, see that, that, rebound. And so what we're doing then is, you know, nor a, a normal eating pattern, one that is more in tune with internal signals rather than just the external factors of someone told me to eat this food at this time. And it should, and, and, but what you said, you know, that is also an external driver. Oh, I don't want to eat a uh, protein shake because I'm going to be judged. Well, that would not be necessarily normal either. You're right. And I think that would be um, counter to the principles of intuitive eating as well. That if that person wants to eat a protein shake instead of pizza, and that is aligned with their values and goals and will feel better to them, absolutely have the protein shake instead of the pizza. But don't choose either one out of shame or guilt. Choose the one that is internally driven. R real quick, Gabby, what would you say? If someone were to say the following, um, after a diet, let's say for a contest, your contest lean and the diet's over, you won your show, finally you have the approval of your friends, new friends who weren't friends with you before you were lean, of course. All of the validation that you've been waiting for. Thank God. So you've got that and now you have two potential choices and let's say we're just gonna polarize them into two choices. One choice is to go into the intuitive eating route or mindful eating and eat to hunger cues, so on and so forth. Another choice is to perhaps uh, predict that your internal hunger cues are going to be out of whack and cause a significant fat regain if you follow them because your body's designed to regain tons of fat back and you may not want to do that very quickly. So maybe you say to yourself, I still have a plan. That plan is the, whatever called the reverse diet, the rebound contest diet, whatever where I'm going to understand, I'm going to be sensitive to my hunger cues, and I'm also going to know that they're going to tell me to eat way more than I should be. So maybe I can alter my diet, have a prescribed number of calories and macros, slowly raise that over time, of course, with auto-regulation built in, um, and also maybe choose the kinds of foods that are not hyperpalatable, purposefully eat lower palatability foods for weeks after a contest so that the regain is more slow, more steady, comes with more muscle, and doesn't just result in me following my heart to eating way too much because I think that for people that are weight neutral, that have been 
uh, you know, uh, struggling with the psychology of eating, I think the intuitive eating approach is wonderful because weight neutral start to that ends in a weight neutral end and maybe even weight loss because now that you don't have any emotionality or less associated with food, you're totally good. I think that after a contest, maybe we should be aware of what's going on, but also have a pretty solid plan in place so that we don't follow our hearts to overeating. So I think hunger signaling is significantly thrown off after a contest. What, what do you uh, think about that, Gabby and, and, and Jackson as well, and M Miguel? And, you know, Steve, I'm not even interested in what you have to say. I'll just throw <laughs> that out there, get a little animosity going. Um, you could certainly do that. It wouldn't be called intuitive eating. And um, I just want to stress that intuitive eating, mindful eating, it's not about following your heart. Um, that certainly, as I said, we want to recognize emotional cues that might um, – cause us to want to eat, but we use our minds to determine whether eating is going to best meet our needs at that time. Go ahead, Jackson. Um, I think Mike's example shows parallels with what um, Jake Lennard and, um, refers to when, when discussing intuitive eating recommendations for people tr struggling with, with eating disorders. Um, and we can arguably say Jake's a, a specialist in this area because he's, he's published in the realm. Um, and what he says is, is these guys go through cyclical periods of dieting, binging and purging, maybe similar to what some crazy contest competitor is doing. Um, and they have those extremely disrupted hunger and fullness cues um, and telling them, just to, to eat what you feel like is not realistic and, and the likely outcome is they're just going to get stressed as hell. Um, so what Jake recommends is, and, and I, I, I can't see why not, this wouldn't be a, um, a, a valuable recommendation for the, for the, the, co the post comp prep, um, the post show competitor who has these disrupted cues um, is to ex establish some external rules first um, to bring back some normalized eating so they know what a, a, a normal day of eating looks like um, before, before intuitive eating is even considered. Mm -hmm. And Evelyn actually does mention that too, that it's not, um, it might not be conducive to the process to go out and, you know, we, trigger foods being foods that might cause a, a binge cycle to go out and, and purchase all of the trigger foods um, that might be present for one person, that it should be sort of, you know, self-paced, that they might start with one food that has been um, somewhat tempting to them. So, you know, for example, if it's like uh, in the past, I, I worked with a client who had a really hard time with chocolates. Um, and, but she felt like hard candies were an okay place for her to start. And so she started having exposure to hard candies and over time she thought oh, she felt comfortable having the hard candies around and then she moved on to, um, individually wrapped chocolates and over time exposure to the individually wrapped chocolates allowed her to establish a, a healthier relationship with the, the chocolates and a, a normal eating pattern with those. So she wasn't going through the cycles of binge and restrict, um, so I think that that's probably one form that would be, um, appropriate. And, and part of the reason that I want to be careful about what we're calling intuitive eating is just to maintain integrity to the program or the, the principles, uh, of intuitive eating as, you know, laid out like intuitive eating TM, uh, to just kind of prevent some of the confusion so that people aren't saying things like, Oh, if you've never counted macros before you can't do intuitive eating. Well, that still is assuming that we have to hit the right macros or that we have to control body weight. And I think the other thing that they really challenge is the idea that a body weight regain would be a form of failure or something to be shameful about or something to be avoided or stigmatized. Indeed, in some individuals who have disordered eating habits, they may regain some weight. And I think we really have to remove the stigma because if this is something that could repair an individual's relationship with food for the rest of their lives, and then, yeah, maybe eventually they do go on a diet or something. Um, but if, if this is an intervention that can be that effective and the only thing that's preventing them from pursuing it is their fear of weight gain because people will judge them, I, I think that needs to be addressed, that we say, okay, it, it's, it's a, there's a potential here that weight gain may occur, and that has to be uh, – just as as uh, amoral 
as, as different foods. That weight gain can occur, it's a possibility, but it's not something that we say is shameful. Of course, now with a physique athlete, it could be potentially they could consider that problematic for their career. But again, I think it just comes down to, to priorities. You know, do you take a short-term break to really work on this for the next year, if that's as long as it takes, so that you can improve your longevity overall? Just like if we had a severe injury, we would say we need to take time off to address this injury, allow it to be fully repaired and invest in that time now so that we have greater longevity overall. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Fantastic. Anything you wanted to add there, Miguel? Uh, no, I was just gonna say that pretty much what, uh, what, what Jackson said paralleled the first time that Steve and I spoke, where I think that uh, if we're gonna be using a, a more intuitive approach in physique athletes, I think that one can't deny the fact that physique athletes are gonna continue to be physique athletes. We can't just say, hey, you're gonna use this intuitive eating approach and just never go back to it because realistically it's what they love and they're gonna, they're, they are gonna go back to it. Um, so I think that within that framework, yeah, it's probably beneficial to do something that would like what Jackson and, and Leonardo are, are saying, where we're kind of bringing these people back to some sense of almost like realism and then allowing them to, to uh, eat intuitively. Because I think that if not, if we just kind of say, like if, if we just bring them into it way too quickly, they're just too messed up at that point. I don't think they're going to be able to, they're, they're not going to put themselves in, in, in the correct position simply because they are physique athletes. Um, and then just one previous thing that, that I wanted to address as, um, you know, as, as we say that, you know, what would be awesome is if we can get people to not feel judged about their weight, if we can get doctors to just use weight as something where it's like, okay, well, we're just going to treat this as some type of outcome measure. Don't feel any sort of way about it. Um, that, that would be awesome. But like, it, it's one of those things that in practice, it just does not happen in practice. Medical professionals just aren't doing it. They are addressing weight from a place of judgment. And it is something that's causing a, a huge ripple effect on, on, on most people. And I think that, you know, the points that Mike, Mike made about doctors being able to address these things with care and compassion and, you know, not making people feel like pieces of shit for their weight. It's awesome, but it just doesn't happen. And we are starting to see like really bad effects of this in the medical community and medical doctors starting to be lazy over just how much emphasis they place on weight. Like a very famous example, and this has happened numerous times before, is a, a specific lady who had a, a chronic back pain. Um, and it went, you know, she, she had obesity. So the doctors just kept saying, Hey, you need to lose weight. This is, this is because you, you're too overweight. You're too overfat, blah, blah, blah. And this happened for months on end. And then finally she found a doctor who, who examined her and was like, you have terminal cancer. You have a, you've had a tumor in your back this entire time. And you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Sorry. And she died. You know, it's like, if we could put these things into practice where doctors are actually putting weight aside and assessing the individual holistically, that'd be awesome, but it's just not happening. That's sorry. Go on, Mike. Uh, I, I can't agree with that more, Miguel. I think maybe the impetus then from an advocacy perspective should be to get doctors either retrained or refocused on being folks who, who precipitate good bedside manner, essentially for lack of a better term, who do treat weight um, and as, as a matter of fact, anything in a non-stigmatized fashion um, or a less stigmatized fashion, it's, it's not it's actually super clear from the psychology research how much stigma may be a net benefit, right? Like, um, you know, when your kid does something stupid and pulls out the TV remote and eats the plug or something, there may be an elevation of tone and a stigmatization of antisocial behavior that is positive for their development. So we can't say like that no stigma is ideal, although in, in my vision of a libertarian adult world, there would be no <laughs> stigma for anything. Maybe some stigma is okay, but certainly extremes of stigma have their downsides. Um, <laughs> but I think maybe it's better to focus on the, the decrease of stigmatization across the board, especially with weight and obesity and so on and so forth, the increase in caregiving, maybe a little bit rather than saying, you know, weight, let's get away from weight altogether. You know what I mean? Like, and Miguel, to your point, it, practically speaking, we might have to get away from weight for a while, maybe a decade um, because it's so such an irreparably sort of tainted thing for now, but I think we should always keep in the back of our minds, like it's not the weight focus that's the problem. Let me give you another quick example. 
healthy versus unhealthy eating. So uh, many of the studies and many of these approaches say, you know, it's, it's not a good idea to tell people to eat uh, less or to tell them to weigh less. We should just get them to eat healthier. So what does that mean? Like more veggies, more fruits, more whole grains, more leads, less junk food. So like, are we stigmatizing junk food now? We could be. So maybe we just switched one stigma for another. Maybe the, the stigma is the problem versus what we choose to t- stigmatize. So maybe I think, I think it's worth exploring for the, not you guys for sure, but for very extreme health at every size people that I've interacted with, I think maybe the, the broach with them is to say, hey, you know, stigma, extreme stigma is definitely bad. Let's get away from that. But I think it's cool to keep weight in the toolbox somewhere to figure out if you know, we're sort of on the right track. Um, and, and maybe the stigma is more the problem than the particular recommendation we give. Because if we do something like, oh, you should be eating healthier and being more active, what's to stop someone from at least internally stigmatizing that? You know, so, so for example, you come to the doctor and he's been trained to not talk about weight with you. So he say, you know, well, how's your eating been? Has it been pretty healthy? And you're like, no, fuck. And you feel stigmatized. And he's like, oh, okay, no big deal. Have you been getting more physical activity? You're like, no, also fuck. And you feel super stigmatized. You feel super bad. And we have that same cycle opening up again, except with a completely different variable. Right. So I think maybe the reducing the stigma and having a doctor be more cooperative with the patient. Um, and the, the whole story about the, the undetectable cancer, I mean, that's just fucking ridiculous, right? Like doctors are supposed to explore multiple sources of causality. Statistically, they're probably right. It is probably obesity. It probably is not good enough when you're paying a doctor whatever fucking gazillion dollars an hour. That you, make. Uh, you want maybe a little bit more intervention. So stuff like that, definitely a bad thing. But I think maybe um, using stigma more mindfully, uh, which potentially means almost not at all or not at with adult humans is maybe uh, something to explore as opposed to trying to versus not destigmatizing weight, not talking about weight. Um, and there's a similar thing can be uh, talked about with, and this is actually happening in a lot of the same social circles these folks run in. Is, uh, you guys familiar with intersectionality as a philosophy, a sociological philosophy, like race, class, gender, body weight, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, a lot of these folks, uh, so it used to be the for example, sexuality it used to be that, you know, if you were straight, that was good. If you were gay, that was bad and you were a bad person. That, of course, is fucking absurd. So then it sort of started to get to this place where, you know, uh, both are totally cool and there's no stigma. Like, do whatever, you're awesome. But they've come around in some of these circles, by no means clear, all of them, but some of the interacting circles of the Hayes movement where uh, you're not even really supposed to talk about sexuality anymore because how fucking dare you? This is something that's deeply personal and it's, it's going to be stigmatized, so don't do it. This is kind of nuts, right? So maybe stigmatization of things that are totally fucking awesome and neutral uh, uh, is, is great. Destigmatization is great. Maybe like, like not using them at all as ways to refer to folks. Uh, you know, like body weight, maybe a bit too much is, is where I'm trying to say as usual with way too many words fantastic guys concerns problems (laughs) steve has an issue steve you think i'm wrong bring it steve (laughs) i'm gonna stigmatize you right now (laughs) god damn so i'm kind of conscious of the time we've had and it's been a tremendous discussion and quite long and i'm almost a bit apprehensive to try and summarize it at all but I will try and give it somewhat of a go and feel free to correct me afterwards or jump in and add any thoughts. But from what I gather from this discussion, at least intuitive eating as a whole is incredibly nuanced. Um, It's been very oversimplified in some circles and there are some potential extremes that maybe aren't the most favorable to that. And for a lot of kind of the wider audience or general population, it can be a very, very healthy thing to focus on and Um, God knows that we know a lot of diets fail and maybe something like an intuitive mindset is going to provide people a better way to go forward. And that includes education, as you talked about, and being informed. And many of these threads can be applied to physique sports um, and they may be in a periodized manner. Um, They may be used now and then to different levels and tapered in and out, uh, but they can certainly be used and should be kept aware of um, the psychological kind of elements of burnout and Gabby mentioned kind of course corrections within her uh, written uh, kind of uh, statement. And I thought that was incredible as well, kind of to just be aware and not kind of be robotic as a physique athlete. Times it might be appropriate, but not always probably because that will risk probably burnout. So 
yeah, anything you guys want to add there again, I want to say a massive thank you for kind of giving me your time and yeah, having a really fruitful discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. I just, um, I think this is hopefully not the last of these types of conversations. Um, and really my goal is to, you know, facilitate and improve the dialogue so we can reach an understanding and not sort of yell at each other from across the divide um, and increase our focus on, on the internal environment um, as much as we are looking at ways to modify the external environment um, just for overall uh, longevity and, and uh, you know, health outcomes and performance outcomes as well for our clients. Fantastic. Thank you all so much, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We cap them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're going to be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.